topical antiandrogens. This is a topic that has been requested in my comment section, and I finally got around to reading a little bit about this topic, so I just thought I would provide my two cents about this class of medication. So topical antiandrogens have been promoted as a more efficacious treatment for male pattern hair loss, and certainly from a theoretical point of view, they are a more comprehensive treatment for this condition. They really do treat male pattern hair loss at the root cause, which is the androgen receptor. So quick review, androgens, these are male hormones like testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. When it comes to male pattern hair loss, this is an androgen-driven condition, hence its name androgenic alopecia. To our best understanding, it looks like male pattern hair loss is caused by genes that are expressed when the androgen binds to an androgen receptor. So in the cells of your hair follicle, the androgen like testosterone or dihydrotestosterone will bind to an androgen receptor. This receptor androgen complex will then move to the nucleus where it transcribes genes into messenger RNA and it translates this messenger RNA into functional proteins. And these proteins through some unknown mechanism of action cause miniaturization of hair follicles and progression of male pattern hair loss. So what this basically means is that anytime a masculinizing hormone like testosterone or dihydrotestosterone binds to an androgen receptor in your hair follicle, the outcome, right, the genes that are expressed from this interaction is what is going to cause hair loss. So with our current best therapies like um, finasteride and dutasteride, what these therapies do is they decrease the amount of dihydrotestosterone, right? Dihydrotestosterone, this is a much more potent androgen than testosterone. And dihydrotestosterone, this is going to bind to the androgen receptor for a much longer time. And it's going to result in a much greater expression of these genes implicated in male pattern hair loss, okay? So by lowering dihydrotestosterone or, you know, crushing dihydrotestosterone into the ground via a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, we're able to really decrease the amount of androgenic signaling in the hair follicle and therefore prevent progression of male pattern hair loss. And these therapies are really excellent. They have really amazing safety profiles. You know, they do have some uh, very rare side effects, but for the most part, they do have very good safety profiles. They do work. They do. Uh, there are many, many clinical studies that have been done on these two molecules. But if you think about it theoretically, even if you crush your dihydrotestosterone into the ground with something like dutasteride, you still have testosterone floating around binding to those androgen receptors upregulating these male pattern hair loss genes and continuing the progression of male pattern hair loss to some extent. So this is where antiandrogens come in. Antiandrogens, these are drugs that bind to and block the androgen receptor, preventing expression of any genes associated with male pattern hair loss. So obviously in the hair follicle and around the scalp, this is what we want. In other parts of the body, this is something we don't want, right? If we don't have dihydrotestosterone, at least we have testosterone to make up for some of the functions of this hormone. But if we just get rid of all androgenic activities in your body as a man, this can cause some very serious problems, which is why we use topical antiandrogens. Topical antiandrogens, the purpose of this drug is to exert its activity around the scalp and not have any activity in any other parts of the body. Now, the problem that I have with topical antiandrogens is a lack of clinical data, both efficacy data, but more concerningly, safety data, right? So the human body, the human body, this is a black box. We don't know how the human body works. We can do animal studies. We can do cell studies. We can, you know, twiddle our thumbs and, you know, make speculations and hypotheses about how the human body works and which enzymes and molecules are implicated in various processes. But until we run studies in a large group of humans where we compare a treatment to some kind of control group and we look at clinical outcomes and we use statistical tools to determine whether or not these outcomes are caused by the treatment or caused by just chance, we really don't know whether or not a drug is safe and whether this drug is effective, right? So that's the problem that I have with the vast majority of topical antiandrogens. In this video, I'm just going to be talking about a few of the most popular topical antiandrogens that I've come across. So are you 58841 possibly one of the most popular antiandrogens? Lots of individuals have had really, really good results with this agent. You know, they've regrown a lot of hair. They haven't had any side effects. 
But at the end of the day, these are anecdotes, right? And when you think about our evidence hierarchy, anecdotes are at the bottom of the evidence hierarchy. They hardly even register. So even though, um, you know, Bob, Bob George or Steve Spielberg or uh, Matt Kwan, even though these guys all had really great um, results with RU58841, that doesn't mean that this treatment is safe and effective, right? We need large clinical studies to determine if this is the case. And unfortunately, there have been no human studies published on this agent. And for that reason, I really can't recommend the use of RU58841. Now, the next topical antiandrogen, Fluoridil. Fluoridil has actually been approved, I believe, in, um, I think it was Czechoslovakia. I think that's where some kind of European country, but it's actually been approved. And there actually is some clinical data on Fluoridil. There was a randomized control trial done in 43 individuals that demonstrated um, better efficacy compared to placebo. And that also demonstrated a favorable safety uh, profile compared to placebo. Um, however, obviously limitations, only 43 individuals. Um, I wasn't particularly impressed by the efficacy outcome. I believe they looked at hairs in the antigen growth phase. They found um, an increase in hairs in the antigen growth phase compared to people that used a placebo. I don't think this is a particularly convincing efficacy outcome. In my opinion, it would have been better if they used a more conventional efficacy outcome like hair density and hair diameter, or even the appearance of the of the hair through, you know, taking photographs of individuals with the same haircut under the same lighting conditions and having them evaluated by some kind of dermatologist. I think these types of efficacy outcomes would have been better. I'm not particularly convinced by um, an efficacy outcome that only looked at the number of hairs that went to the antigen growth phase. This study, I have to give it credit as well, they did run, I think it was like the second part of the study where they looked at the pharmacokinetics of this drug. So they looked at how much of the drug got into the bloodstream. I think it was in like 19 participants, but they did find that fluoridil does not get into the bloodstream to any significant extent, which in my opinion is good for its safety profile. So fluoridil, you know, some clinical data, not enough to recommend in my opinion. I unfortunately wouldn't be able to recommend this agent either. The last agent I want to talk about is something called Brizula. Um, that's the brand name. Uh, Brizula, this agent has a lot more potential. Now, Brizula has actually been through phase one and phase two clinical studies. The phase two clinical study I thought was very, very impressive. It was done in, I think, about 600 individuals. Um, it did find positive efficacy outcomes. And the efficacy outcomes that were monitored were hair density, so improvements in hair density, and also improvements in hair diameter, which are efficacy outcomes that I am uh, much more impressed by. I also liked this product because it had really great safety outcomes. I believe they didn't find any differences between people using Brizula versus people using a placebo, so good safety outcomes as well. And if I remember correctly, they also found that Brizula does not get absorbed into the bloodstream to any significant extent, but I'll have to just double check that. The other thing I love about Brizula is that Brizula has already been approved for treating acne. Although it was approved in a lower strength, I think it was like 1%, whereas for male pattern hair loss, it's probably going to be like 5% or 7.5%. But at the 1% strength, Brizula is safe and effective for treating acne. So in my opinion, if the company that makes this product was able to get FDA approval for acne, they're probably going to get FDA approval for hair loss. Uh, some of the limitations with Brizula... These studies have not been published yet. You know, the outcomes from these studies have only been released in press releases from the company. So once those studies are out, I'm going to read them. Maybe I'll make a video about them, but that's something we're still waiting for. If the results are correct and if the company is not up to any funny business, I do have high hopes for this product. I do think in the next five or 10 years, we will see um, some type of FDA approved antiandrogen for treating male pattern hair loss. And if Brizula does in fact become approved, this is a product that I will personally recommend and that I will personally use as well. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you liked the video. Um, before I finish the video, someone also asked me to comment on, I think it was alpha, um, let's see. Alpha tradiol, alpha, alpha tradiol. Someone asked me to comment on that. I did a little bit of reading about it. Um, alpha tradiol, it's not really something I'd recommend either, unfortunately. I wasn't particularly impressed by the efficacy outcomes that were observed in uh, studies looking at alpha, alpha catriol. Um, in addition, it was mostly studied in women. I would prefer to see studies in men.
you know, Kevin Mann from Hair Cafe makes the argument that alpha-catriol alpha is a molecule that addresses the root cause of male pattern uh, hair loss and therefore um, would be something to consider. However, I usually look at clinical outcomes. And if the clinical outcome of alpha catriol is less um, hair growth compared to minoxidil 2%, which is not exactly the most efficacious treatment, then I wouldn't be particularly high on this molecule, especially considering that we don't have the same amount of clinical experience for alpha catriol. If alpha catriol was used for treating acne or some other uh, clinical indication, and we had you know large randomized control trials and thousands of people looking at the safety of this molecule, in that case, I would have a different opinion. For now, I just haven't seen enough clinical data evaluating the safety of this molecule. And because the efficacy is also not great, I personally wouldn't recommend topical alpha trial either. So, you know, I apologize for this video. I know that um, it's potentially disappointing for certain individuals. I know that there are a lot of uh, very intelligent people, you know, people that know way more about hair loss than I do, like Kevin Mann from Hair Cafe, like Derek from More Plates, More Dates. Uh, these individuals really do advocate for using uh, topical antiandrogens in certain cases. Um, unfortunately, from a conservative healthcare pr uh, provider perspective, I just wouldn't be able to recommend topical antiandrogens at the moment. Okay, thank you guys for watching. Much appreciated. If I said something wrong or incorrect, let me know in the comment section below. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. I don't think anyone knows everything. And just because I have a doctor in front of my name doesn't mean I always know what I'm talking about. There are lots and lots and lots of examples of people with doctorate level educations that uh, are just, you know, saying nonsense. So, so if I say anything wrong, let me know in the comment section below. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. So quick plug before I finish the video, I've got a new pharmacy opening up with uh, some of my colleagues at 1715 Victoria Park in the greater Toronto area. So if you're looking for pharmacy services or if one of your family members is looking for high quality pharmacy services, if you're tired of going to chain pharmacies where the uh, wait times are 30 minutes, where they forget about your prescription, where they um, you know, don't have enough time to talk to you about your medications and your particular medical situation, I would advise going to our new store. It's going to be located at 1715 Victoria Park Avenue inside the medical clinic at this address. Uh, we've got all the best pharmacists like myself, like uh, my colleagues, Chris Wong, like Walter Lum, who's a diabetes expert. And we've got all different types of pharmacy services. We do delivery, we do blister packaging, we do comprehensive medication reviews, uh, pretty much everything. The only thing we don't do is compounding. So if you're looking for like a topical finasteride minoxidil mixture, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to make that just because the uh, compounding laws in Canada are really, really strict right now. But um, for all other pharmacy services, visit us at 1715 Victoria Park, Surrey Victoria Park Pharmacy. You can also visit our main store at 1314 Victoria Park. That is Victoria Park Pharmacy. If you or your loved ones are looking for high quality pharmacy services, visit us at one of these addresses. You can also give us a call at 416-752-0888. That's 416-752-0888. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.